Good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me to present here, and uh, thank you for staying here as the last presentation um, before um, you all can go off and enjoy um, your after work dinner, drinks. Acusella is a Seattle-based ophthalmology company. We claim to be technology agnostic. We focus solely on diseases of the eye, and we're trying to find solutions for these diseases. And based on this, the majority of our projects we have in our pipeline are actually small molecules. We do also have medical devices, and most recently we added a gene therapy to our portfolio. We are here for the first time at the gene therapy meeting. Which one do I need to press? And I want to introduce myself quickly. I'm the head of R&D of Acucella, and I have about 15 years of experience in ophthalmology have launched multiple small molecules and multiple medical devices in my career and also have an extensive background in business development. I'm also going to talk about retinitis pigmentosa, so I can cut this a little bit short as you have heard already quite a bit about the disease just from the talk before. Um, it is an inherited retinal disease. It is caused by um, many, many gene mutations. Over 100 are already known and it's orphan, it affects about one in 4,000 patients. The typical onset of the disease is about at the age of 10 to 15, and at the age of 30 to 40, these patients are blind. There is currently no treatment available for this disease. And as said before, it starts with a loss of contrast sensitivity, and then a gradual loss of peripheral vision, leading to tunnel vision, until to complete blindness, as shown here. So when you think about this disease, you can actually approach this disease and think, how shall we uh, offer a treatment? We can go the path down and say, we want to stop and we want to prevent loss of vision. That's shown on the left. Or you can go and say, hey, we want to restore vision in blind patients. Now, those are obviously completely different approaches. On the left, what you do is you treat patients early at the age of 10, 12 years old, 15 years old, when you have disease onset, you have to treat them then. While on the right, you treat them at the age of 40 when they are really blind and when you want to restore vision. There are other differences which are important. Because this is such a slow progressing disease where the patients typically lose their vision over 30 years of time, to really demonstrate the treatment benefit if you want to stop the progression of the disease is extremely difficult because the disease progresses very slowly, and that results in huge clinical studies to present and demonstrate the effect, and that translates into substantial amount of capitals you need. If you restore the vision, it's different. You can demonstrate restoration relatively quickly, therefore you have small clinical studies, and therefore you need much less capital. We picked as an approach to restore vision in patients who have already lost their vision and who are blind. So how would we like to do this? When we looked at the technologies and the approaches available, we opted to take an optogenetics approach. The reason for this is that this is basically gene mutation independent. What we de do here is we take a cell which is still intact inside the eye and we make this cell light sensitive. And we're doing this by having this cell expressing an opsin, a light sensitive protein, and that then triggers the signal into the brain of the visual stimulus. This approach has been published in the literatures in the last 10 years or so, and there are multiple approaches available. So here is the qu first question we asked ourselves, which cell type shall we actually transduce? Which cell type should become light sensitive? What you see here on the right is a sort of a magnifying pictogram of the eye. On the very far right, you have the photoreceptors, and these are the cell lines, the cells which die in the course of the disease. However, what is made, uh, written here as level 2 and level 3, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells, those two cells are still intact over a long period of time, and they die off in the course of the disease only at very, very late stage. So we decided we want to go and make the bipolar cells light sensitive. And the reason we picked the bipolar cells over the ganglion cells, or for that matter, the amacrine cells, which are not really shown here, um, is that those are the cells which are closest to the photoreceptor, and therefore they're closest to the visual signaling, 
and therefore we expect to get the highest efficacy and the highest visual signal into the brain which is closest to what the photoreceptors would deliver if the photoreceptors would still be there. The next question, after we know we go into the own bipolar cells, the next question we asked ourselves is what type of opsin do we want to use? And we have multiple um, options here, as shown here. We picked human rhodopsin. Human rhodopsin is a G protein coupled receptor. Other rhodopsins are basically ion channels. And the advantage of the human uh, rhodopsin is twofold. First, because it's G protein coupled, the signal is actually amplified. And so you need less light to have a visual stimulus into the brain. The other one is, versus all the other options are, it's a human protein and it's already naturally in the eye. We're just expressing it in a different cell type. And therefore we expect a lower risk of immunogenicity than if we go and use, for instance, a microbial opsin or a channel rhodopsin or something like this. So that's the rationale we picked human rhodopsin. The next the question we approached was, how do we want to deliver? We looked into various different delivery methods and we pretty soon homed in and said we're going to take an AAV. But the recent data suggest that actually what works very nice in a mouse may not work in a non-human primate. And we don't have really data yet whether these uh, um, capsids work in, um, in, in humans. So we decided to engineer our own. And we started the project to make our own uh, capsid specific for the unbipolar cells through a targeted mutagenesis uh, approach and um, also trying to find one which is actually independent of the species, such that we have more uh, assurance that whatever we take is actually at the end going to work in humans as well. Obviously, we also need a promoter, and we have created, um, we are working on a promoter which is an engineer promoter, very specific to the on bipolar cells, because these cells tend to change in the course of the disease, and we want a promoter which works in the diseased patient. Uh, leading to high specificity and high expression levels. So, you, so our project here is really, in summary, is we take human rhodopsin, we deliver it with an engineered AAV and with a specific promoter, and we want to express human rhodopsin in on bipolar cells. Now, you may ask yourself, how are we going to do this? We're a small molecule company, and we ask ourselves the same thing. Shall we now just hire all the people we want to have we're a startup company, and we decided that's not the path we want to go. Instead, we created a virtual network of collaborators. We're working very, very closely with the University of Manchester uh, on the transgene, on human rhodopsin, all the pharmacology experiments and so on. They are done at the University of Manchester. We are just in the last uh, strokes of finishing our collaboration for the engineered AAV. We're working with a European company here and we will have a proprietary and exclusive rights to an, um, an engineered AAV capsid. We're working on the promoter end uh, already in full speed with a company in the Bay Area, Circularis, and we have exclusive, exclusive rights to this promoter. And we are at the moment looking into with whom we want to work on manufacturing and preclinical development. We are also, as a startup company who is currently uh, funded, but uh, obviously a startup company, we are also always looking for capital, obviously. So if somebody wants to partner with us, we would be very open and willing to, to do this. So let me show you now a, a little bit of data why we think this is actually going to work and why we think um, we have uh, the right approach. We have um, treated a variety of mice, RD knockout mice. This is a mouse model which develops photoreceptor death and um, is very similar in its pathology to uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa in humans. We have treated these mice with our construct and we have observed in various models uh, the efficacy. Now I want to show you here a fun model. It's not mandatorily the, the most uh, predictive model, but it's a fun model. And what we did here is we treated mice, RD knockout mice, we treated them and compared their, the effect of what we have towards blind mice, untreated, sham-treated mice, as well as wild type. And what we did is we showed these mice a video of a swooping owl. And we, we wanted to see how they react and whether their locomotive function, how their locomotive function is. And that's what you see here. So we showed them a video of the swooping owl. And um, interestingly, the blind mice, the untreated mice, they basically don't change at all when you show them uh, the 
the video while the treated mice behave very, very similar to the wild type mouse, demonstrating that this approach not only results in expression of rhodopsin in uh, the on bipolar cells, which we have done in other experiments, but also results actually in a functional signal of these cells into the brain such that a natural behavior of these mice is restored when you show them this video. So what we have at the moment is um, we think we have an excellent approach to restore vision, functional vision, in patients with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. We are very uh, convinced and um, we are, uh, believe it's going to work because the visual signal pathway is highly conserved between mice and human retinas. Our approach, in contrast to other approaches, is mutation independent and uh, it restores vision, and it may actually even work in other diseases like uh, in than retinitis pigmentosa, at lo as long as the uh, neural retina with the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells and also the RPE is still intact. And last but not least, because we restore vision, we can, approach, we can implement our quick win fast fail approach as a strategy we have in our, in our company, which aims to demonstrate the treatment effect as quickly as possible. We think we can restore vision in a time frame of about three months, while others will require, if you look at small molecules therapies, for instance, one to five years to demonstrate whether uh, their therapy has any benefit in retinitis pigmentosa. Here is where we are in terms of our development plan. As I said, we are working full speed on the promoter. We have started to work on the AAV, and we are just about to announce with whom we're going to do this. And at this point, we are looking into with whom we're going to manufacture our material and then go into the non-clinical studies and followed by our first in-man study. Thank you very much. Questions? No? How do you target the interneurons? How do you specifically target the interneurons to deliver the reduction? To deliver? The deliver route? Sorry. <laughs> the delivery route will be either subretinal or intravitreal injection. This is still a, a certain level of debate. And I think one of the um, criteria is going to be how evenly distributed. Uh, the expression is going to be in the retina. We don't want to get just some f focused, localized, you know, when, when you get the expression around the vessels and so on. So we don't want to end up with this. I don't think we're going to have a, a decent efficacy otherwise. Okay. Thank you very much.